And if you've been going through this study uh, on revival, if you've been going through this study we've called downpour, uh, then you have seen the holiness of God. And uh, because of that, you have uh, taken some time, I hope, uh, both in church and outside of church to reflect upon your own sin and through the process, the biblical process of repentance, uh, to find uh, the grace of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness that he offers. And I uh, can tell you that I've had a crisis uh, in my faith this fall and a real renewing and a stirring of fresh love uh, to the Lord. And I trust you've been experiencing that too, but we're not done yet because if you're like me, uh, you may be wondering or asking, okay, I've had this crisis, but, but, but how, do, how do I keep the river flowing? How do I de- keep the downpour falling? How do I keep on going on in the Christian life? And what do I do when I struggle or stumble or fall? Paul. Now, well, the answer to all of those questions is uh, found right here. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk to you tonight about the Holy Spirit, a picture of power. And even before we open God's Word, if I could just kind of in a survey fashion remind you about some of the things that the Scripture says about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ lives in me. The Christian life is Christ in you. There is no Christian life apart from Christ in you. And Christ is in you by his Holy Spirit. Jesus said to the disciples, if I uh, go, uh, the comforter will come. If I don't go, uh, he's not coming, so I need to go. And he will come, and I have been with you, Jesus said, but he will be in you. And this is the promise of the Holy Spirit. Not just Jesus by my side talking to me, but the Holy Spirit in me actually living the life of Christ out through me. That is the Christian life. And if you've never been taught that before, just uh, please understand, God has made no provision whatsoever for you to live the Christian life. The Christian life is a life of yieldedness. Yes, there are things we do. We worship and we walk with Christ and we work for Christ and we exercise our will. But even in all of that, it's it's Christ in you, uh, the hope of glory, Paul said. And uh, that's why Jesus said to the disciples, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he was like, uh, do not pass, go, do not collect $200, just get in a room and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me. And I'm sure the disciples wanted to go and, and get together a plan for building the church. He's like, no, no, I really don't do anything. Just go wait in the upper room. When you have the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to do it all. Without the Holy Spirit, hold up the universal symbol for how useful the disciples were without the Holy Spirit. Uh, nada. Okay? And so we want to talk tonight and just be reminded about what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit and how can I experience the ongoing, indwelling, overcoming presence of the Holy Spirit in my life and uh, what to do when I don't. All right, let's take a moment and uh, bow together in prayer. Father, uh, thank you uh, tonight uh, that in the name of Jesus we can come before you. And thank you, Lord, that you've not left us alone in this world. Thank, for, thank you for your son uh, who came to earth and died as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Thank you that he rose from the dead to prove that he's God. Thank you that all who come to him through faith in him can have their sins forgiven. For those of us who have made that choice, Lord, we would live for you. Well, we make it our aim to be pleasing to you. And so we ask that you would teach us tonight about yieldedness, yieldedness to the Holy Spirit, and what it means to uh, experience the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life. Uh, these things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, more uh, of the Spirit, less of me. How does that sound? More of the Spirit, less of me. Let's start uh, with a little bit of theology, and we're going to be turning to some scriptures uh, tonight. And uh, in the first part, I'm not even going to make you turn because I don't think you can turn fast enough. There's a challenge for you. Let's start here. Learning about the Holy Spirit's presence. The Holy Spirit's presence. A little theology on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Start here. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Um, Every bit as much as the Father and the Son, one God eternally existing in three persons. Distinct and separate, yet one. Now, I don't understand the doctrine of the Trinity, and uh, all human illustrations fall short. I remember growing up, someone said, well, it's kind of like water. It can be liquid, and it can be solid, like ice, and it can be vapor. Well, no, no, that's not really it. And and some people say, well, it's like an egg. It's like the shell and the white and the... uh, No, no. It's a mystery, all right? And I I think all of those sort of uh, human uh, illustrations fall incredibly short. Here's what I know. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, Hear, O O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. 
And uh, then, of course, if you've ever studied Scripture carefully, you know that at the baptism of Jesus, when Jesus was coming up out of the water, the Spirit was descending in the form of a dove, and there was a voice from heaven, uh, from God the Father, saying, this is my uh, beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, Trinity means tri-unity, three in one. It's a mystery. I don't understand it. I just accept it. And it seems like Every other month or so, we get on a subject like this in Scripture, and I think it's good for you all to be being taught, and I hope you're learning this, that there are mysteries in the Bible. There are things we just don't understand, and I know people who say they understand it all, and I think they don't understand anything, okay? Least of all, do they understand that there are mysteries in the Bible, and I think we get arrogant and proud and and overtly uh, clever and very man-centered when we think we have all these things figured out. And I love to quote to you Deuteronomy 29, 29, which says that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which have been revealed belong to us. Now, the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity anywhere, uh, but the Bible does show the Trinity. Uh, Go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the, tell me, Father and Holy Spirit. Okay, but hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Uh, Three in one, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is God. Now, you must understand this, the deity of the Holy Spirit. James, why are you so insistent on this? Well, because the Scripture is. Now, here's a couple of thoughts about the Holy Spirit being God. Number one, he has the names. Uh, The Holy Spirit has the names of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, he is called the Spirit of our God. In Acts 16, 7, he is called the Spirit of Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, he is called the Spirit of Adoption. That means he has a participative role in salvation. All right? Now, the Holy Spirit bears the names of God. In addition to that, the Holy Spirit has the attributes of God. He has omniscience. That means he knows everything. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, No man uh, can know the things of God except the Spirit of God. No man can know the things of God except the Spirit of God. And so the Spirit of God knows everything, the things of God. Uh, The Holy Spirit also is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. In Psalm 139, verse 7, David said, Where can I go from your spirit? How can I flee from your presence? If I go into heaven, you're there. If I go into the lower parts of the earth, you're there. Everywhere I go, there you are, by your spirit. All right? And so God's spirit is not only omniscient, he's omnipresent, and he's omnipotent. In Job 33, 4, uh, Job Uh, The scripture writes, Job wrote, the spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty has given me shape. And so the spirit of God was the agency or the activeness of creation itself. And so he's omnipotent. The Holy Spirit is God. Fact. The Holy Spirit is God. Here's a second thing. The Holy Spirit is active. All right. Uh, The Holy Spirit of God is very, very active in the world today. All right? Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. All the things that we talk about constantly, about what the Lord is doing, the Lord is doing. We're talking about the Holy Spirit when we say those things. Now, we don't highlight the Holy Spirit because uh, the Scripture tells us that the very heart of the Holy Spirit, uh, this third person of the Trinity, is to make Jesus known. The Holy Spirit is not looking for attention or to have uh, uh, his name in lights. The focus uh, in Scripture is that the Holy Spirit wants to glorify uh, God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now, the Holy Spirit is active. As I said, he was an instrument in creation. Genesis 1-2 says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Uh, In fact, in the incarnation of Christ, do you remember that when uh, Mary was told uh, that an angel angel appeared to Mary and said that she was going to give birth to Jesus? Uh, Luke chapter uh, 1, verse 35, Mary was like, how's this going to happen exactly? She said to the angel, how am I going to give birth to God's Son? Luke 1, 35, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. The very matter of the... uh, conception of the God-man Jesus Christ was a ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, pictures of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. Uh, Matthew 3, 16, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. Behold, the heavens were opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. Dove is a picture in Scripture of the Holy Spirit. Fire and wind, Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost arrived. They were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven. This is the coming of the Holy Spirit. There came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them. All right, wind and fire are pictures of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. And then oil. Oil was often used for anointing someone. Samuel, 
uh, was anointed, and David was anointed, and, and it was a ceremony, and that a pouring of oil was a picture of the Holy Spirit, Acts 10.38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. And then as we've been studying here, a water in Scripture is a picture of the Holy Spirit. When I preach my heart out so that my <coughs> voice is almost gone to you about God reviving your heart in Him, all right, what I most specifically have in mind, biblically speaking, is the Spirit of God taking more control and more influence and more of what you yield to Him in your life. And um, in that regard, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, is water. John 7, 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, Jesus, this he said about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. Again, this he said about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. Have you believed in Jesus? Have you done that? Did you get the Holy Spirit when you did? You did. I'll say more about that later. The Holy Spirit is active. Write these things down quickly. He is the source of all truth, 1 John 5, 6. He is the author of Scripture, 2 Peter 1, 21. He is the convictor of sin, John 16, 8. He is the provider of comfort, John 14, 16. He is the promoter of salvation, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. He gives boldness to witness, grace to stand, courage to follow, hope to endure. That's the Holy Spirit. He illumines God's word. He prays for God's people. He advances God's agenda in this world, in this country, here in this church, and in your home and life. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Did you get all that down? I love doing that to you guys. I'll post that on the website. All that's to say this. The Holy Spirit's doing a whole lot in the world. All right? Let me just give you that list again. Listen, listen. The source of all truth, the author of Scripture, the convictor of sin, the provider of comfort, the promoter of sanctification. He gives boldness to witness, grace to stand, courage to follow, hope to endure. He illumines the Word of God. He prays for God's people. He advances God's agenda in this world, in this country, in this church, and in your family, and in your life. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, is he active? Yeah. Yeah, he is. Now, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is active. Make a note of this third thing. The Holy Spirit is personal. The Holy Spirit is personal. We must never ex accept the heresy that the Holy Spirit is just a force or an influence. Uh, the Arians taught in the early church that the Holy Spirit was, quote, the exerted energy of God, the result of God's work, but not a person. The Socians at the time of the Reformation taught the very same thing. In this past century, theologians like Schleiermacher, the Unitarians, most neo-Orthodox theologians, denied the distinct personality and personhood of the Holy Spirit. Now, in this century, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness this is Jehovah's Witness Church, a quarter of a mile from here. They do not believe what I'm teaching right now. They do not believe in the deity of the Holy Spirit. They do not believe that the Holy Spirit is God. They believe that he's the force of God or the influence of God. They do not believe that he is God. Now, well, can we prove that from Scripture, that the Holy Spirit is a person? You should be able to. These three references will help you. Start with this. If the Holy Spirit is really a person, then he should have the elements or the attributes of personhood. Now, remind me of your first name. Hey, Mike, what's up? You sit in that exact seat every week. It's really getting to be quite a thing. And she seems to always be with you. That's good. <laughs> That's your wife, right? Good, excellent. Now, I don't know you very well, um, but I certainly recognize you. And I'm going to think that uh, you're probably a person. Okay, and because you're a person, you have to have these three things. You have to have mind, you have to have emotion, and you have to have a will. Those are the elements of personhood. Animals do not have that. That is the essence of your soul, your heart. Mind, emotions, will, and all of that, all right? Now, mind, emotions, will. Does the Holy Spirit have that? The elements of personhood? 1 Corinthians 2, 11 says that the Holy Spirit has intellect, the capacity to know a characteristic of personhood. <clears throat> Ephesians 4.30 says that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can make the Holy Spirit sad. Ephesians 40, 4.30, do not grieve 
the Holy Spirit, by whom you were sealed to the day of redemption. So we can, the Holy Spirit has intellect, the Holy Spirit has emotion. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says that the Holy Spirit chooses which gifts to give to believers, quote, as he wills, end quote. And so the Holy Spirit, when you come to faith in Christ, he gives you a certain gift. He gives you something completely different. He gives you a different gift entirely from that. And we all get gifts given to the Holy Spirit as he wills, as he chooses. The Holy Spirit is not just the force of God, not just the influence of God, but personhood. Father, Son, what? Holy Spirit. He is God. He is active. And he is personal. Far more than a force or influence. The Holy Spirit is here today in our church. The Holy Spirit is moving right now, using the Word of God, illuminating truth in your life, convicting us of sin, calling us to righteousness, reminding us of the reality of judgment. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, revival, at the end of the day, it's this. It's more of the Holy Spirit active in me. The Holy Spirit working, stirring, moving, moving in me. The Holy Spirit... Now that's learning about the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk about living in the Holy Spirit's power. This is really what I wanted to get to with the message. That's kind of the theology backdrop. Y'all did really good there. You're getting better and better at listening to theology being taught. I want to build my life on truth, don't you? I don't want church just to be a bunch of feelings. Feelings are good, but I want truth. Truth is what sets you free, isn't it? And now we know about what God's Word says about the Holy Spirit. But now let's turn over to Ephesians 5.18. One of the most important little passages in, in all of Scripture, really, certainly in the New Testament. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says this. It says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, excess. It means wickedness. Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that. You know, Pastor James, I'm struggling in my marriage. I'm having a hard time loving my husband the way that I should. What should I do? Be filled with the Spirit. You know, Pastor James, I know you're exhorting everybody this month to give a gift to seize the opportunity, but I don't really want to do it. I like my stuff more than I like the church, and I don't really want to share what I have, and I can't wait for this month to be over because I have no intention of doing anything about that. What, 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 what do I need? You need to be filled with the Spirit. You say, well, you know, I, 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 you tell us all the time we should serve God, and I'm so thankful for the several hundred volunteers that were involved in the, in the uh, pastor's conference this week in our church, and I know so many work in the children's ministry. I just dropped my kids off. I know I'm supposed to work for God, but I don't really want to. What do I need? I need to be filled with the Spirit. All, you're not, if, if you don't want what God wants for your life, you are not being filled by the Spirit. Notice again in the text, be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, he's active, he's personal, and he can fill your life. Let's define what we mean by that, spirit filling defined. Uh, the Greek word here is plerustha, which means to be filled, controlled, intoxicated, permeated, thoroughly influenced. Now if you want to understand a word in the Bible, go ahead, every person here, underline that word in Ephesians 5.18, underline filled. You getting that there? You getting it? Filled, good job. Underline it. All right? I want you to be able to go back there. This is a very, very important verse. We're going to spend the rest of the message almost right here. Being filled. If you want to understand a word in Scripture, look at how it's used in other places. In Luke 4, 28, uh, the Scripture says that some of the religious leaders were angry about Jesus' teaching, and they were filled with rage. The Scripture, same word. In Acts 13, uh, 45, certain Jews were resenting Paul and Barnabas and their success, and the Bible says that they were filled with jealousy. Okay? It means to be overcome by a power greater than your own. That's what it means to be filled. Have you ever been filled? It means to be overcome by a power greater than your own. Let me give you some more on this. Now, filled, overcome by a power greater than your own. I know what it feels like to be filled with pain. Do you? I was moving something in my closet the other day, and I was in my bare feet, working around, shuffling some things around, and I don't know what happened exactly, but somehow I got my toenail, my big toe, on the end of a piece of furniture, and it tore the whole top half of my nail right off. I want you to know that in that moment, I wasn't a pastor anymore. I wasn't, a, I wasn't a husband, I wasn't a father, I wasn't even a person. I was one big 
throbbing toe. That was all there was, just the toe. I was, no, no, I didn't say any bad words. I'm not telling you what I thought. I was filled with pain. When you're filled with something, that's really all there is. I know what it's like to be filled with joy. I remember when I got married, I remember turning and seeing Kathy. We were married outside. I remember seeing her coming down the aisle and being filled with joy. I remember when each of our three children came into the world and I held them for the first time. There was nothing but that joy to be filled with joy. I know what that's like. I, um, I uh, hope by the end of today, all White Sox fans will be filled with joy. I, I, uh, and by the way, all you Johnny-come-latelys, I just want you to know that I've been a White Sox fan for five days. <laughs> okay? We're illustrating the word filled. Filled. Do you know what it means to be filled with something? To be, there's nothing else now. There's just this. Nothing else. Be filled with the Spirit. Let's analyze it a little bit further. You can't believe it, but there's four things I want to show you right in that little phrase. Be filled with the Spirit. Notice four things. Here's the first one. Notice that it's a command. Be filled with the Spirit. You probably know God doesn't give a lot of suggestions, right? God's not like, well, this could be good. You'll have to give some thought to it. No, God's more like, do this. Don't do this. God doesn't waste a whole lot of time with input. He just gives commands, and this is one of them. And, and, but it's good news, see, because, uh, because it's commanded, that also means that it's possible. God doesn't command us to do things not possible, right? Hey, look up here for a minute. Every single person here tonight who has turned from their sin and embraced Christ by faith, if you've been given the authority to be called a child of God through faith in Jesus, you can be filled with the Spirit. Isn't that good news? God doesn't command you stuff, and then he's like, oh, that's never going to happen for her. No, it's not how it works, all right? And because God commands it, it is possible. Now, nowhere in Scripture are we commanded to be indwelt. Nowhere. Nowhere are we commanded to be sealed. Nowhere are we commanded to be baptized because we have no part in those things. They happen at conversion. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit were you all baptized into one body. When I turned to Jesus Christ by faith, turned from my sin and found the Lord at the cross, I had the forgiveness of sins. I was immersed into the body of Christ. I was placed into the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, I was sealed with the Holy Spirit, which means that that can't be changed or taken away. All right? The issue in filling is not do I have all the Holy Spirit. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have all the Holy Spirit. The issue is does the Holy Spirit have all of you? Now that's an issue of filling. And here it's commanded. It's also passive in the original language. If you remember your gr English grammar, God is implied as the source. We are the object acted upon. Therefore, you can't fill yourself. I'm going to go get me some of that Holy Spirit. All right? A God fills you with his Holy Spirit. All you can do is ask. And then I love this. In the original language, you can't see it here, but it's, it's plural. Uh, the idea is, is that this is not for the spiritual elite. Oh, you know, Pastor Rick, I bet he's filled with the Spirit. No, no, listen, you can be filled with the Spirit, all right? It's for everyone, for all believers. And then, this is very important, it is repeated. The actual verb there in the original tense is continuous action. Some translations, maybe your translation, uh, uh, writes literally, be being filled, all right? So, you know, here's an important thing. One baptism, we're baptized uh, into the body of Christ at conversion by the Holy Spirit. That's when he comes to indwell us. He's in me now. Sanctification is the process of him getting total control of me, and that's not just up, up, up. So how many people have taken a backward step in their life spiritually? Anybody? All right. When I take a backward step spiritually, I'll say more about this, I forfeit the filling of the Holy Spirit. Can I have it again? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, believers at Pentecost were filled once, Acts 2, 4. Those same believers were filled again, Acts 4, 8. Paul was filled, Acts 9, 17. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit again, Acts 13, 8. One baptism, many fillings. One baptism, many fillings. I've taught you before, I try to begin every single day, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit today. And sometimes uh, throughout the day, I have to turn back to the Lord, Lord, forgive me for that thought, Lord, forgive me for that word, and, and fill me again with your Holy Spirit, control me now. Now stop for a moment. 
to be really filled with the Holy Spirit, I can tell you this. You have an almost tangible sense of the Holy Spirit controlling you. Let's talk about spirit filling illustrated. Now, the best illustration always is the illustration that the Holy Spirit chooses. Look at Acts chapter 18, or pardon me, at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 there. Ephesians 5:18. What's, what's the illustration that the Holy Spirit gives us in Scripture of spirit uh, filling? What's the illustration? What is it? Drunkenness. Oh, that's nasty. We have to come up with a different illustration. No, no. Let's go with the one that the Holy Spirit chose. Amen? In fact, not just here, but four times uh, in Scripture, Luke 1, 15, Acts 2, 4, Acts uh, 2, 13, and Ephesians 5, 18, four separate times the Spirit of God inspired the writer of Scripture to use drunkenness as a picture of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, why? Well, I don't know if you've ever uh, been drunk anymore, or uh, I don't know if you've ever been drunk before. That's nothing that you should glory in if you have. It's sin to be drunk. But if you have been or you know someone who's been or surely you've observed uh, someone under the uh, influence of an inappropriate amount of alcohol, you know the first thing that happens is they have no, con- they have no control over their tr- tongue. They say all kinds of things that amaze and amuse people. People who are drunk have no control over their tongue. Am I right? And people who are drunk have no control over their body. Police pull them over, sir. You're going to need to get out of the car. You were swerving on the road. What does the policeman want him to do? He wants him to walk the line. Can he do it if he's drunk? No, he can't. Can he's kind of like this, you know? And he's going down the line. He doesn't. He doesn't have control of his body. People who are drunk have no control over their mind. Ask them a simple question. They're like, I, uh, my, I, and they start freaking out. People who are under the control of alcohol have no control over their emotions. They're fearful and paranoid and angry and silly. And uh, so, do not be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. You want to be controlled by something? Be controlled by the Spirit. When I'm controlled by the Spirit, I don't have control of what I say. The Spirit of God has control of what I say. All in favor of the Spirit of God having control of what I say? That's being filled with the Spirit. I don't have control over my body. I eat what the Spirit of God tells me to eat. I don't feel guilty and I don't have these things. I know I shouldn't really be eating. I'm going to eat it anyway. No, I wouldn't do that. And, and the Spirit of God can be an amazing guide in our life. No control over my mind. The Spirit of God wants to control my mind and what I think about. If you're trapped in some negative pattern of thinking or anger or resentment or bitterness or frustration or impatience or fear or worry, don't you want the Spirit of God to have control of your mind? Don't you want the Spirit of God to be directing the things that you focus your mind upon? This comes with the filling of the Holy Spirit. And how desperately we need the Spirit of God to control our emotions. Well, I'm going to talk in a moment about how to be filled with the Spirit. But let's turn over to Romans chapter 8. And let's talk for a few moments about um, you'll know you're filled with the Holy Spirit when. As in, am I filled with the Holy Spirit now? Romans chapter 8. Now, it's not a subjective thing. There are many blessings that come with the filling of the Holy Spirit. Joy, peace, comfort. Uh, Paul here gives five uh, blessings that come with the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to start reading from Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Um, Follow along with me there. He says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Okay, look up here for a sec. Think about that phrase. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So, conversely, anyone who does belong to him, what? Does have the spirit. Okay, sometimes it helps to read from the reverse standard version. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him, so everyone who does belong to him does have the Spirit of Christ. Verse 10. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, that means your body's decaying, it's dying, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Even though you're physically going south, 
Even though you're physically going down, spiritually you can be going up. The outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. Now, verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. All in favor of a resurrection? See, not dragged down by sin, but if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So there it is again. The life of the Christian life is the Holy Spirit, period. The energy, the power, the strength, the comfort, all the things that you ask for. Keep in mind, God does not dispense strength and encouragement like a druggist fills a prescription. And you're going to pour some strength all over you, all right? What God gives us is, God gives us his spirit. That is the strength. That is the peace. And when I'm filled with worry, I'm not filled with the spirit. And when I'm filled with the spirit, I'm not filled with worry. Verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors. Not to the flesh. We owe the flesh nothing. How many people feel like they've paid the flesh enough? Yeah. We're not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's not just physically, because that wouldn't be much of a news flash, because everyone's going to die physically. That's talking about dying spiritually, eternally. If your lifetime is a lifetime of feeding the flesh, you don't really know the Lord, and you will die eternally. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. How do I become a, a, a man of purity? How do I become a woman of righteousness? How do I become a man of integrity? By the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. The Spirit is the strength to do what's right. Without the filling of the Holy Spirit, I'm like a piece of straw in, in, in one of those California firestorms. Okay? I got no time left. I'm going down on my own. I'm going to stand against that sin. No, you better run. That's what you better do. You better flee that temptation. Only the Spirit of God is the strength to do what's right. Now here come the characteristics or the proofs of the Holy Spirit filling. Am I filled with the Holy Spirit now? Ask yourself these questions. Number one, is he leading me? Is he leading me? If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit today, the Holy Spirit is leading you. He's leading you what to say, what to do, how to do it. Notice in verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God, another translation says. So, are you one of God's children? Okay, well if you are, and you're filled with the Spirit, the Spirit of God is leading you. He's leading you. He's directing you. We had a phenomenal time this week with the pastors who came to the pastors and ministry leaders who were at our conference this year. And it was just packed out with people. And it was just fantastic. And I was standing up over here at the end of the last service. And this guy comes up to me. He says, James, i got to tell you this story. He says, last night when David Jeremiah was speaking, he says, my wife wanted to see Navy Pier from so bad. I forget whether they were from Arizona or something. I'd never seen them before. He says, my wife wanted to see Navy Pier so bad, and we've been to so many. He says, we went downtown. He says, and we got feeling really bad, he says, because we thought, well, we probably should have been in the session. We got so lost. He says, we couldn't find Navy Pier, and we're driving around and around and around downtown. He says, finally, my wife says, I, I got to use the restroom. So we pulled over to a little shop, and there was a coffee shop there, and my wife went in, and I got in line to order something, and, and the woman at the counter, she said to me, she said, well, she said, uh, she said, where are you from? You're not from here. Because you're asking, he was asking directions to Navy Pier. She said, well, you're not from here. And he said, no, no. He says, um, we're from out of state. And, and uh, she said, well, what brings you to the area? And he says, well, he says, we're here at, at, a, at a church conference up, up uh, in the northwest suburbs. We're at a church conference. And, and she says, oh, what church? He said, well, it's James McDonald's church, which we all know. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> He said, Harvest Bible Chapel, and he used my name. And <laughs> the woman bursts out crying. I mean, like sobbing, crying, and she runs away. He was just like, whoa, I guess. Uh, I, have, I have that effect on a lot of people. <laughs> but but um, she, she, she ran away, and, and he was feeling badly, and so he kind of kept waiting in line. She came back a little bit, and he said, well, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't, I didn't mean to upset you. And no, she says, no, no, she says, you didn't upset me at all. She said, I've just moved here. I can't remember what state he said from the other side of the country. And she said, she said, I've been looking, 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 looking for a church. And she says, all I can tell you is one day, one time on the radio, I heard this guy, and she used my name. 
And I prayed for the last few days, God, I have to know where this church is. I have to know who this person is. She couldn't remember the radio station where she couldn't remember anything. And here's this guy who skips the conference <laughs> and gets lost and is the answer to her prayer. Now listen, you cannot tell me, I hope she'll be here this weekend. He told her all about the church and she's so looking forward to coming. Listen, but you cannot tell me that the Spirit of God did not lead them, even in their errors and everything. Isn't it good to know that even when I'm being stupid, God's being smart? <laughs> and, 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 but listen, this is the ongoing experience of the child of God. And I don't have amazing things like that happen to me every day, but pretty much every week. So the Lord leads you. He leads you to the right place at the right time with the right person. He puts the words on your mouth. This is one of the characteristics of being filled with the Holy Spirit. He's leading me. Here's another one. He's giving me confidence. Look at verse 15. Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit, small s, that means the attitude. You did not receive the attitude of slavery to fall back into fear. Okay, again. If I didn't receive a, an attitude or a spirit of slavery to uh, leading to fear, what did I receive? Well, you know, fear is what you have before Christ. You talk to people who don't know the Lord, what are they? They're slaves to fear. Fear of the future, fear of dying. What's gonna happen? Will I have enough? People who don't know the Lord are, listen, they're filled with fear. And when the Spirit of God comes to live within you, he displaces that fear if he's filling you, if he's controlling you, and he gives you instead confidence. One of the overriding characteristics I observe in the life of a person, listen, who knows and loves the Lord and is filled with God's Spirit is confidence. I'll never forget last year when we had our, I'm going out to uh, Elgin Sunday morning this weekend, and I haven't been there since July, and so I'm thankful for the Niles folks and the uh, people here in Meadows who are going to watch this teaching on video, and I'm going to go out and challenge them about seize the opportunity. I remember uh, more than a year ago now when we uh, broke ground on the new worship center out in Elgin, and Dr. Stoll's father, you know Joe Stoll the fourth and the third. Did you know that there's the second? <laughs> He's like 90 four years old, and he, he was so frail, Dr. Stoll's father, he came walking out onto this site, and we had to kind of help him and stuff like this, and he, he was so frail, and pray for him. He lives in a nursing home in Wheaton, and we asked him to pray a dedication prayer on that property. We put the microphone in his hand, and I'm telling you, he called down the thunder. He prayed and lifted up his voice and prayed and asked God and called upon God and prayed blessing down on that location. It was an awesome thing to observe. Now, I've been saying that all year long, I've been saying, hey, remember that when your grandpa came and prayed down the thunder? I say, it was, it was really an amazing thing. Why, why, why? A lifetime of being filled with the Spirit. It's just confidence, just confidence. I trust the Lord. I trust the Lord. I don't know what's going to happen, but my confidence is in God. This is a characteristic of a person who's filled with the Spirit. Now, if I, even if I know the Lord, if I'm filled with worry and anxiety and uncertainty, that is not a ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know what it says, uh, the New Testament? It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind, all right? That's what the Spirit of God gives to us when he fills us. Leading, confidence. Notice this, intimacy. Intimacy. It says there at the end of verse 15, it says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. That's the Spirit of God, active in salvation. As sons, we're children of God, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, whom, by whom do we cry out, Abba, Father? By the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes to live within us. He wants us to say something. What does the Spirit of God want us to say? He wants us, thank you. He wants us to say, Abba, Father. Let me ask you again. What does the Spirit of God want us to say? Abba. Lift up your voice. What does the Spirit of God want us to say? Abba. You know what that means, don't you? Abba, Father. That's just an intimacy term, like some kids say, Daddy or Dada or or uh, it's interesting to hear, again, Dr. Stoll's grandchildren call them Papa. That's cute, isn't it? Papa. Every culture has its own little phrase or term that it uses. Listen, it's a term of intimacy. I was in a worship service this week, and I uh, was uh, basically just participating and listening, and there was a man standing beside me, and, and I'm telling you, for the entire time, and it was a fired-up worship service, for the entire time he was like this. the whole time. That was his whole thing. Uh, 
Houston, we have a problem, okay? There's a definite problem there. And the problem is the Spirit of God is not controlling that person's heart because the Spirit of God is pushing us toward intimacy with God. Abba is a term of intimacy, all right? And, and by the way, it, it's not a public term. I never use the term Abba in public prayer because intimacy is for privacy. It's not for publicness. But God is trying to get every single person here, every woman, women are on this, by the way. Men, we're the ones that stink at this. Okay, God is trying to get every single woman and man in this room where you don't feel ashamed or silly or embarrassed or anything in your private personal times before the creator of the universe to call him Abba, Daddy, I need you, I love you, I, 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 I want you, I'm seeking you. You say, I think I'd feel a little freaked out to talk to God like that. Well, all I'm telling you is, is that the Spirit of God is trying to bring you to the place where you desire that and pursue that and experience that. That's a ministry of the Spirit of God in this world. Is to, because what keeps me from doing that? Just my pride, just my walls up. I don't want to feel anything. I don't want to just that keep God at arm's length this far and no further. And the Spirit of God's trying to break that down. That's an evidence of filling, a desire for, and a pursuit of intimacy with God. Then notice this security, Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Look at that. Read it yourself. Romans 8, 16. Go ahead and read it. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, don't put your hand up. Don't put your hand up. How many people struggle sometimes with whether they're a Christian or not? How many people honestly ask themselves the question, I wonder if I'm really a Christian. I wonder if I'm really saved. I wonder if I'm really... Well, newsflash, okay? It's a ministry of the Spirit of God to confirm to you the reality of your relationship in God's family. That's a ministry of God's Spirit. Now listen, how would Kathy and I feel if we came home some night when our children were a lot smaller and we found them somehow down in the basement and we overheard their conversation? They're like, I'm not really sure if we're theirs. I'm not sure either. I don't know if we really belong to them. <laughs> now how would, a, how would a parent feel about that? Tell me, how would a parent feel? lousy about that. What, what, what are you talking about? You're not sure. Of course you're ours. You mean, grab them and hold them. Well, don't ever say that again. Of course you're our children, see? And how does God feel? God wants us to know that we are his. And God's spirit, one of his ministries is, is to confirm to you the reality of your place in God's family if, in fact, you are in God's family. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You say, well, I want that. I, I want to experience that. Here's a couple of reasons why you might not be. Here's what we do to lose the spirit of the, fill, the, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Number one, we grieve the spirit. Ephesians 4.30 says, do not grieve the spirit. I grieve the spirit when I do things the spirit doesn't want me to do. When I talk to my wife in a way the spirit of God doesn't want me to talk like that. When I say things and do things, just think about sin in the mirror and that whole message. Sin grieves the spirit of God. And sometimes, as we've learned, it's not just doing the wrong things, it's leaving the good things, what? Undone. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 says, don't quench the Spirit. I grieve the Spirit when I do things the Spirit of God. Listen, the Spirit of God lives in you. I mean, tell you, we treat, we treat guests from out of town better than we treat the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us. What, what, what are we looking at this for? What, 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 where, where, why are we going over here? We grieve the Spirit and we, we lose His filling. Sometimes, though, there's things that God's Spirit wants us to do. Tell her you're sorry. You go first. Admit you were wrong. Do this for me. And when we don't do the thing that the Spirit of God wants us to do, we quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5.19. It means put the Spirit's fire out. And I'm sad to say that I've seen this happen in my life. And the Spirit of God is like, do this! And I'm like, no, no, no. And the Spirit of God is like, do this! And I'm like, mm, mm. And the Spirit of God is like, do this. And then it's like, whew, you quench the Spirit. Okay? And if you're not experiencing the, con the confirming security of the Spirit of God in your life, you're sitting here and going, I don't even know if I am a child of God. These things aren't going on in my life. All right? Well, maybe they're not because of sin. And only repentance and, and confession of sin and repentance can restore the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. Here's a final thing. Leading confidence, intimacy, security, lastly, identity. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. 
What's an heir? An heir is a person who has the rights to everything that belongs to the Father. Someday it will all be ours. Look up here. Someday it will all be ours. We live like paupers when we're children of the King because we're not experiencing the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to have a constant reminder in my life of the unsearchable riches of Christ and all that belongs to me as a blood-bought son or daughter of the King of Kings. All right? That's the identity as an heir and a joint heir with Christ. Well, finally then, starting again, let's talk about how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> All in favor of being filled with the Holy Spirit? All right, this is the Christian life. All in one message. The Holy Spirit is God. He's active. He's personal. Be filled with the Spirit. There's the confirmations. Now, if you want to be filled with the Spirit, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're not, what are you waiting for? Turn to Christ tonight by faith. And along with those who know him, pray this simple prayer from your heart. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, do these three things. Number one, confess all known sin. Confess all known sin to God. Anything you're harboring, anything you're holding, anything that's in the way, it's got to go. It grieves God's spirit. Confess all known sin. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You will not be filled with the spirit harboring unforgiveness. Some of you here, you've known the Lord for years, but you've been living a carnal Christian life for 20 years. Not one day filled with the spirit because of something you won't let go of, something you won't change, something you won't do. You've got to be current with God's spirit to be filled with God's spirit. Confess all known sin. Secondly, ask God to fill you. Ask God to fill you. I often quote, you'll often hear me in my prayer, quote a favorite verse from Luke chapter 11, uh, verse 13, where it says, if we ask him for bread, will he give us a? But the part that I don't quote a lot is the next part, which says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? All right? If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, if your kids ask for something, do you know how to give it to them? Sure, I love my children. I love to give to them. Well, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Confess all known sin. Ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And then lastly, believe that he has filled you. You gotta believe it. Jesus said, whatever you ask, in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, whatever you ask in faith, believe that you have received it, and it will be done for you. All right? So confess all known sin, ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit, and believe that he has filled you. All right, ready to pray? All right, let's all bow together. Let's start there. Confess all known sin. Keep in mind that you can't fool God. It's not a matter of rattling off two or three things. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. What percentage of Jesus' followers are really living the Spirit-filled life? Confess all known sin. Now ask the Lord to fill you. You might just hold out your hands to the Lord, just open as if to receive, and just say, Lord, come and fill me now with your Spirit. Lord, I want to be filled with your Spirit. I want to be controlled by you. I don't need any more time to prove to myself that I can't live the Christian life on my own. But I believe you want to live your life through me. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Holy Spirit of God, come and fill me now, control my life, my thoughts and my actions, my words and my feelings. Control me. Fill me now. And then pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Spirit of God, for filling me. I believe that you are controlling me in this moment. And I'm going to live as one in your power and strength who is controlled by the Spirit of God. Amen?